A better YouTuber would take advantage of the fact they live an hour away from New Orleans by driving down there to collect stock footage and record these on-camera scenes. But Louisiana infrastructure is terrible, and navigating that city during Mardi Gras is a nightmare, so please forgive my laziness. No. The Princess and the Frog is a fascinating movie. It's simultaneously the relic of a bygone animation era and the precursor for a decade's worth of financial and critical success for Walt Disney's studio. The film has plenty of praiseworthy elements. All the characters are charming, the visuals are utterly stunning, and the music is quite catchy. Going down the bayou. Going down the bayou. But there are a few discordant pieces that contribute to an overall sense of dissonance for me, and I'm not the only person who feels this way. Fellow critics have pointed out the film's complicated relationships with race, gender, and religion, and I want to address those elements. They're a core component of the text. But for me, all of the film's issues stem back to a key storytelling choice that almost no one acknowledges. The setting. Dreams do come true in New Orleans. <laughs> in other Disney princess films, the setting is often nebulous and irrelevant. These places exist to make the narrative functional. Their cultures are malleable by design. The filmmakers can create traditions and customs from whole cloth and use them to craft a larger aesthetic picture. The histories they write are essentially works of fan fiction for the universes they invented. But unlike Corona or Arendelle or Nameless Medieval Kingdom No. 3, New Orleans is a very real place. As such, it offers far less flexibility than a poor provincial French town or a vast fantastical ocean. New Orleans exists in a state of perpetual contradiction. It's a cultural melting pot with a long-standing history of racism and oppression. The distribution of wealth ranges from ostentatious opulence to obscene poverty. In her 2021 essay, A New Orleans Chef Navigates Disaster, Helen Rosner described this metropolis as the city of a thousand restaurants, but only one menu. Capturing its bizarre essence is not an easy task, so it's not surprising that most portrayals of New Orleans are kitschy at best and actively damaging at worst. Setting isn't just a physical place, though. Another important factor is time. This film is set during the Roaring Twenties, and for a vast number of reasons, 1920s New Orleans didn't operate like this. Racism is sewn into the fabric of Louisiana, and it's particularly inextricable in regards to the history of New Orleans. For example, the city was a focal point of interest for the Confederacy during the American Civil War, and it was a core component of Union General Winfield Scott's Anaconda plan to split the South in half. The region was forever changed by this conflict. Its impact is still observed today in countless ways, from the state's socioeconomic status to what's offered on local cafe menus. Here's your coffee, brewed from the finest Colombian lighter fluid. Thank you. If you've ever had a cup of coffee from New Orleans, you probably noticed it had a stronger, more aromatic taste. That's because it's commonplace here to roast, grind, and add a substance called chicory root to your coffee beans. France started this practice during the 19th century, but it became popular in New Orleans during the 1860s because Union blockades brought the coffee import business to a screeching halt. Though it lacks caffeine, chicory root is a cheap substitute that tastes fairly similar. Thus, the custom became commonplace even after the war ended. Mm. Tastes like tradition. My point is, New Orleans has a fairly complicated past, and the filmmakers completely ignore this reality. There's only one line in the entire film that can be described as derogatory, and I'd sooner label it classist or sexist than racist. Which is why a little woman of your background would have had her hands full trying to run a big business like that. This is historical revisionism at its finest, and it contributes to the film's pervasive sense of dissonance. Let me be clear, though. I'm glad this film didn't try to tackle the intricacies of racism. Every time Disney tries to address this topic, it's clunky and unsuccessful because they insist on creating allegories where the racists actually have a valid reason to be racist. But watch out, because I'm a fox. And like you said in your dumb little stage play, us predators used to eat prey. God, I hate Zootopia. The thing is, The Princess and the Frog didn't have to take place in New Orleans. It's based on an Eastern European fairy tale. But instead of building a setting from the ground up, the filmmakers took this existing city, melted it down, and poured it into the Disney formula's mold. The resulting product is a bit of a mixed bag. Some scenes are lovingly crafted tributes to jazz music and the city's unique architecture. Others are plagued by stereotypical and gimmicky references to well-known aspects of New Orleans culture. Like, here's a question for you. Why is Mardi Gras featured here? 
Nothing tangible happens at the stroke of midnight. Sure, it signifies the beginning of Lent, but the holiday isn't intrinsically magical. I think the filmmakers included Mardi Gras because the general public is vaguely aware of its significance to the city, and the fact that this artificial and self-imposed deadline also serves as an homage to Cinderella is powdered sugar on the beignets. Does that count? Yes, it does, but only till midnight, when Mardi Gras is over. Falli, falli, Voodoo receives a similarly shallow treatment. This African diasporic religion has a notorious reputation in American pop culture for being satanic witchcraft, but these portrayals are steeped in sensationalism, and The Princess and the Frog maintains this unfortunate tradition. Voodoo? You mean to tell me this all happened because you were messing with the Shadow Man? He was very charismatic. Dr. Facilier is a walking caricature. Friends on the Other Side is a fantastic song, but it's also the only interesting thing about him. When you strip away his dark magic and evil trinkets, all that's left is a greedy grifter. Aren't you tired of living on the margins while all those fat cats in their fancy cars don't give you so much as a sideways glance? Yes, I am. On the other side of that spectrum lies Mama Odie, a voodoo priestess who's functionally Tiana's fairy godmother. Neither character is an accurate portrayal of the craft, but they're not supposed to be. This film is a swan song for the classic Disney princess flick. It doesn't want to be accurate, it wants to be familiar. And that desire becomes blatantly obvious when you overanalyze Ray. My name Ramon, but if I call me Ray. Ray is delightful. He and the other Fireflies are analogous for Louisiana Acadians, better known colloquially as Cajuns. During the French and Indian War, the Acadians were expelled from their homeland. They eventually resettled here in South Louisiana and became a prominent contributor to the state's varied culture. I don't have anything negative to say about their portrayal in this film, because I have neighbors who behave exactly like Ray. Actually, we are from a place uh, far, far away from this world. Go to bed! You're from Shreveport! And uh, no, 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 no. Cajuns are some of the best people around. They're resilient and funny and ridiculously brave. Anytime a natural disaster hits Louisiana, you can count on the Cajun Navy, an unofficial collection of volunteers who are credited with rescuing thousands of people over the years. Above got to do what above got to do! Yeah! Ray is ride or die from minute one. And make no mistake, he definitely dies. If I had a nickel for every time a firefly's lifespan was cut short, I'd have two nickels. Damn you, 20th Century Fox! In many ways, Ray is the heart and soul of this film but his relationship with Evangeline is particularly peculiar. You're my queen of the night, so still, so bright. On the surface, his unrequited love for the evening star is silly yet sweet. But if you grew up in Louisiana, then the name Evangeline should ring a few bells. In 1847, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow published an epic poem that depicts the tragic separation of a young couple, Evangeline, A Tale of Acadie. To quote Marie Elizabeth Oliver, Longfellow's poem left a lasting impact on Louisianian folklore, culture, and oral tradition. The town of St. Martinville christened a shrine to the fictitious star-crossed lovers along the Bayou Teche in the form of a majestic live oak tree, though Longfellow's poem doesn't include any mention of a Louisiana oak tree. I actually visited this place on a middle school field trip. It's really pretty and honestly kind of haunting. There's another version of this story written by Judge Felix Voorhees that's somehow even more tragic than Longfellow's original poem. And though his account was later proven false, the devastating aspects of this legend continue to linger in the state's collective consciousness. Disney took this unique piece of local folklore and turned it into an origin story for the second star to the right. What? By now you probably think that I hate this movie, but nothing could be further from the truth. I love The Princess and the Frog, dissonance and all. I'm not pointing out all of these cultural inaccuracies because they frustrate me. I'm doing it because they fascinate me. The art of adaptation is a delicate matter, and creative liberties are a storytelling necessity. It just so happens that the liberties taken here pertain to a topic I'm particularly knowledgeable about. Louisiana isn't a fun place to grow up, nor is it an ideal region to spend your early 20s, but for me, it's home. My roots here run deep. Tiana's dream strikes a real chord with me because my family used to own and operate a very famous seafood house in Jefferson Parish. Swanson's was renowned for its steaming hot food and clever gambling loophole. Danny Meyer was my great uncle. My copy of Pride and Prejudice originally belonged to him. New Orleans isn't the only city I have ties to. My grandfather was raised in Hammond, an ever-growing town with a vast Italian subculture. 
Another chunk of relatives live near Monroe. My friends went to college in Ruston and Lafayette. Louisiana is more than a loose collection of stereotypical iconographies, and it's annoying to see it be portrayed as such. But despite everything, this film is still really endearing, thanks in no small part to its spectacular protagonist. Well, Miss Tiana, rough night for tips, but every little penny counts. Tiana is an amazing character. She's a passionate and plucky young woman who's overflowing with ambition. It's practically impossible not to root for her throughout this film because her goal is abundantly clear. Buy the old sugar mill and turn it into a successful restaurant. But this single-minded focus is both a strength and a weakness. Girl, all you ever do is work. Order up. Maybe next time. I told y'all she wouldn't come. Dreams are extremely important and we should definitely nurture them but we can't let them become obsessions. I've seen some people claim this movie's ultimate message is happiness equals husband, but I don't think that's true. The only character who outright states this is her mother. And speaking from personal experience, that's to be expected from a mom. Ain't got time for messing around. Then it's not my style. I want some grandkids. Even still, the lesson Eudora is trying to imbue here is far more nuanced than give up your dream and go marry your Prince Charming. Your daddy may not have gotten the place he always wanted, but he had something better. He had love. In her memoir, Turn Your Pain Into Art, singer and songwriter Arielle Bloomer says the following. Success is the ultimate illusion. Reaching your goal will be pretty amazing but it will not be the magic pill that solves all your problems. You can only enjoy living your dream if you're already healthy and strong. Tiana's aspirations are admirable, but she's unnecessarily sacrificed a lot of personal enjoyment. Her tunnel vision prevents her from pursuing literally anything else. I don't have time for dancing. That's just gonna have to wait a while. How long are we talking about here? Life happens wherever you are, whether you make it or not. I completely understand Tiana's plight. I've personally been told that I'll have to give up this quote-unquote silly video-making hobby once I get married and have children, which is just a yikes on so many levels, but I'll be the first to admit that sometimes I get way too wrapped up in a project. Finishing a video is gratifying, but my loved ones are the real source of joy in my life. Brunch dates with Madison, browsing bookstores with Emily, stupidly long FaceTimes with Anna, sharing memes with my sister, sipping coffee with my parents, hiking with Jessica, Fishing with Zach, playing with my pets, these are the things that bring me fulfillment. Working towards a goal is mere icing on the cake. Life is all about balance, so when you shape your entire identity around a dream, you aren't making time for reality. Tiana's dream is partially tied to her grief. She thinks that opening a restaurant would validate all of her father's hard work and give some semblance of meaning to his suffering, but her father never dwelled on what he lacked. Despite the hardships, James was quite content with the life he cultivated. He never achieved his greater dream, but he still built an enriching support system, and he loved it with every fiber of his being. You do our little girl got a gift. <laughs> I could have told you that. A gift this special just gotta be shared. Enter Naveen, a spoiled prince who's only ever valued superficial things. He and Tiana are perfect counterbalances. She works too hard, and he doesn't work, period, end of sentence. You do not know how to have fun. No, you're a no-count philander and lazy bump on a log. Naveen falls in love with Tiana, her work ethic, and her dream throughout their adventure together. And Tiana finally comes to understand what her parents meant whenever they said, never lose sight of what's important. My dream wouldn't be complete without you in it. The filmmakers aren't saying romance is the only path to happiness. They're simply advocating for us to make connections, to build communities, and to enjoy ourselves. We're only here briefly, so follow your heart whenever you can. Our paths aren't set in stone. Stay open to life's possibilities, because beautiful things can come from the most unexpected places. Truth be told, the only thing that's holistically bad about The Princess and the Frog is this joke. Uh, how old did you say you were? I'm six and a half. Well, I waited this long. FBI, open up! This video was brought to you by my patrons. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider pledging. I would deeply appreciate it.